uh, and that, that I find to be extremely rewarding. And that's happened later in my career than in the beginning of it. How do you think um, chemical research will change in the future, uh, from, especially from what it was when we started? But what do you, projecting ahead, how do you think chemical research will change? And uh, I think, Marcetti, you hit on what uh, uh, some of the enduring qualities have to be. Uh, so let me ask you that. How will it change? Well, one thing that worries me a little bit is that we become too uh, organized into large groups that are somehow interacting by your internet or what have you in a very formal way. Uh, I think good research is always going to be done by individuals. They should obviously be interacting and I think interactions for me have always been natural. If I need to know something from someone, I send them an email or I call them uh, and I don't have a formal relationship with them to interact. Uh, so I worry a little bit if science becomes too much as a group interaction that it will will somehow inhibit the, these individuals from you know going in various directions which often are, are very very fruitful directions. Uh, but I suspect it will it will change because it's just a lot more interdisciplinary. We're working on bigger problems and, and problems that one person can't possibly address alone. So I think that's where the bigger changes are going to come and how we handle that to still keep PIs, uh, private, uh, uh, principal investigators, uh, uh, funded so that they can develop to be really strong contributors to any group interaction. Uh, that's going to be critical, how we solve that issue, because it's the funding level is going to, th those two areas are going to be in conflict for the same, same, same funds. Uh, I, I take your question a little bit differently in terms of the, the type of chemistry that we're doing. You know, if I look through my career, I saw at first physical methods were coming in and x-ray crystallography was really difficult. You know, I had to I had to bribe Jerry Atwood with cases of beer to get my structures done. But, but then it got really, really easy and we got wonderful infrastructures that uh, can support the spectroscopy, the crystallography, and so forth. So synthesis and characterization has become extremely easy and a, a, a lot of work is just in that. But I think we go through another phase where reactions and reactions mechanisms will become what we have to do, what we have to understand. And that will probably involve a new wave of um, fast kinetics, uh, instruments that we can more carefully monitor what's going on in that reaction profile. And I don't know what instruments, what, what uh, spectroscopies and what techniques are going to be around the corner, but I suspect there should be some, some new ones. I think there are, there are threads from both of what you said. Um, Don, if I have it right, and I tend to agree with you there, the, the, the best collaborations are one-on-one -on -one and bottom-up as opposed to necessarily top-down. Uh, and uh, is that, is, yeah, would that be? Yeah, I think, I think sometimes force collaborations, uh, you don't really get your money's worth from them. Uh, I always find that I, if I have this strong interest in, in, in solving a problem, I'm going to get the most out of it. And people are very willing to interact. We, we don't have to pay them to interact with each other mm -hmm. because we want to solve our problems and that's the driving force. So, so we're going to interact. Yeah. The, the other part is, um, you know, the, the user interface for all these techniques, for x-ray, for DFT, for NMR, has become so easy that students today are asked to work on projects of greater scope than we did. You know, a couple of crystal structures we could get a thesis uh, 40 years ago, but now that's not the case. So we ask them to really do a greater scope 
and this then necessarily takes them into a collaborative mode. Right, and I, I do have to say that um, centers for uh, special spectroscopies are really needed. Um, EPR at an advanced level, for example. I, I mean, I spent the first, my first 30 years of my career avoiding radicals, and now everything I do has unpaired electrons in it. So I really need EPR, I need MOS power, uh, and I have to collaborate outside for those. As we have collaborators in Germany. I wish there was more money for travel, for students to travel and stay at places. I think there's some modes of funding that n needs to be addressed at the national level that will um, allow more of that to occur at the student level. Other than just my grant funding this, uh, there, there could be student applications for travel funds. Okay. I would want to turn to a different subject. Uh, inorganic chemistry, the journal. Uh, is celebrating his 50th anniversary year. Both of you began your careers, I guess, shortly after inorganic chemistry started. In fact, Ted Brown was uh, one of the early associate editors of inorganic chemistry. So how did you view the journal way back and today, uh, and what do you see going forward? So let me uh, start with uh, how you viewed IC in the early days? Well, um, in the early days, I was happy to get a, a publication in wherever it was. But inorganic chemistry was inorganic chemistry. That's the, the fundamentals of, um, of our field. And I guess we just switched from nuclear and inorganic. Was that? It. That was one of the early things be before inorganic chemistry, the journal started. Uh, there was, I guess, inorganic chemistry was in the division sort of under physical, si uh, physical chemistry and, and inorganic and nuclear chemistry. But that's, uh, that goes way back. Yeah. Well, I've always viewed it as the journal for, for fundamental inorganic chemistry. And uh, it's, it stayed that. Uh, it has expanded, of course. Are you asking us now about the, the broader view of inorganic? But it's expanded. Uh, the, the journal, though, has always had high standards. We did consider, we do consider.